So what we want to do is cultivate the compa uh, cultivate a capacity for kindness. So close your eyes. Take a few moments to breathe in and breathe out. So what we want to do is cultivate the compa uh, cultivate a capacity for kindness. So close your eyes. Chat. Hello, chat. Welcome to another Healthy Gamer GG stream. My name is Alok Kanoja. Just a reminder that everything we discuss on stream today is intended to be for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing is intended to be taken as medical advice. So if you all have a concern or question, please go see a licensed professional. Um, just a reminder that although I'm a psychiatrist, I'm really not here to give you all medical advice. And uh, if you all you know, need medical support, go see a licensed professional, you all. Okay, so a couple of quick um, announcements. So we're still working on, I think, week two of Right in the Feels. And uh, we've got some exciting stuff planned for the next couple of weeks. So just a reminder that Right in the Feels is our community event in which we hope that people start to get um, kind of more in touch with their feelings. 
feels.healthygamer.gg. Let me just make sure that this, yeah, okay. Well, I have to sign in, but. Um, so if y'all are interested in kind of like more practical uh, exercises, mood tracking, things like that, that's like, a, it's a community run event. So you can sign up at feels.healthygamer.gg. Um, you know, so if y'all want to learn a little bit more about what you're feeling, what you're experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis and kind of track it. And then we've got some other cool stuff coming up like Empathy Labs, which is our attempt at like, we're going to share, you know, a block of text with y'all and you try to figure out, okay, what is what could this person be feeling? And the neat thing about that is it sort of like recruits the part of your brain that sort of like analyzes emotions, tries to sort of build empathy, things like that. So we'll see kind of how that goes. Um, and it's just a good chance for y'all to actually do some skills building around emotions. This seems off. bothering me. But anyway, so today we've got a couple of cool things going on. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about bipolar disorder. And uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about motivation and emotions, um, hopefully falling in love a little bit and productivity and getting distracted by, you know, you like YouTube and other digital forms of distraction. So let's get started. Okay. Let me just make sure that we're kind of set up here. Okay. So today I want to talk to you all a little bit about bipolar disorder. And more specifically, I've had a ton of patients who frequently want to go off of medication. And the more that I, I've talked to people about who, who have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, they have a real love-hate relationship when it comes to medication. So on the one hand, medication can be really, really good for stabilizing your mood, kind of keeping you consistent on a day-to-day -day basis helps people finish college, helps people sort of maintain healthy relationships. There are a lot of good things for medication with bipolar disorder. The challenge is that oftentimes the medications come with pretty heavy side effects for a lot of people. We're not talking about, um, you know, sometimes they can have physical side effects as well, but a lot of times what I hear from my patients with bipolar disorder is that they feel kind of mellowed out a little bit. They don't feel like life is quite as exciting. Um, they also sometimes feel like it causes problems with their creativity. And the most common reason that I hear from my patients about why they want to stop their medication is because they can handle it now and it's under control. And so why should I continue taking medication if I'm feeling really good every single day? And so that's a really, really good question. And it's, it's actually a really challenging issue. But what I'd love to do today is to talk to you all a little bit about how I think about bipolar disorder um, and sort of how to think a little bit about medication and common things that a lot of patients and honestly, even a lot of doctors and nurse practitioners may not really know or, or the way that they kind of think about. So hopefully this will be a little bit educational. It'll help people understand a little bit about why, generally speaking, psychiatrists will be in favor of their patients staying on medication, even though everything seems to be going really well. So the first thing that I kind of want to start with is, is almost like a, a provider or a clinical perspective. So I've talked to a lot of psychiatrists and nurse practitioners about, you know, how they prescribe medications for bipolar disorder. And I'm a little bit surprised actually by how simplistic a lot of the thinking is. So a lot of times people will sort of think about, okay, here's a disease. Here's a medication that treats a disease. So let's just start the medication and stick with the medication. It's like pretty simple, right? That's how our system of medicine works. <laughs> If you've got pneumonia, start antibiotics, and that'll kind of fix the problem. And what I've, I've really found that's actually quite disturbing is that I, I've seen a lot of patients who are coming in from other providers who will be on tons of medications and presumably for bipolar disorder. And I'll kind of ask them like, okay, like, why are you taking these four medications? They're like, oh, I'm, I'm bipolar and I've got ADHD and I've got anxiety. So this is why I'm taking all these medications. And I get kind of confused by that because... When I look at the medications, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, like how these medications kind of all got piled on. And usually what I, I in, in the bad scenarios, what we've got is someone who's really sort of treating a, a disease as opposed to a person. They're sort of thinking about, okay, this is like, here's bipolar disorder. So like, let's give you some medication. And if the patient comes in two months later and they're still experiencing symptoms or their bipolar disorder isn't under control or they're complaining of something or their family complains of something, someone will like add an additional medication and add additional medication. And then it, it, you sort of get into the situation where people are on tons of medications and aren't even sure what they're doing. I would say that for a lot of patients that I've seen who are coming from other providers, that 
the majority of them actually do better with like fewer medications, but the ones that are selected correctly. And that's what I'd love to share with you all today is kind of my perspective on how I sort of think about bipolar disorder and, and how to think about whether medications are appropriate or not. So once again, a big disclaimer that these are all things, this is for educational purposes only. I don't recommend that you alter your medications based on anything we talk about today, but rather use th what we talk about today as a, a launching pad into conversations with whoever's prescribing you medication and ask questions like, why am I being prescribed these regimens? What's the, what's the sort of clinical reasoning behind this medication, this medication, this medication, this medication? Why are you giving me this? What is this one supposed to do? What is this one supposed to do? What is this one supposed to do? And oftentimes it, it's patients who unfortunately have to advocate for themselves because it, especially as we're sort of, as mental health providers are becoming increasingly burdened, oftentimes what's happening is a lot of patients are being overprescribed medication. So let's talk a little bit about bipolar disorder. The first thing to understand about bipolar disorder is it's, it doesn't mean that your mood fluctuates wildly on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll sometimes talk to parents who'll be like, oh my God, my kid is bipolar. Anytime he plays the video games and if we stop playing the video games, then he throw, he throw, starts throwing things and temper tantrums and this and that. So a lot of times people will confuse temper tantrums or mood swings with bipolar disorder. And generally speaking, that's what we call emotional lability, and it's like not actually bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is characterized by periods of time that are pretty extensive and are, are dominantly like have a, a mood fluctuation. So what that sort of means is we're talking about three months of depression or six months of depression or one, month, or one year of depressive symptoms, or we're talking about weeks of hypomanic or manic symptoms. So it's not like you're depressed one day and manic the next day. That can happen sometimes, but it's usually not really what bipolar disorder looks like. It's the exception rather than the rule. So what we're talking about in bipolar disorder is extended periods of time. We're talking weeks or months with a particular mood fluctuation that then kind of resolves and then people can kind of flip the other way. So for example, oftentimes when people have bipolar disorder, they'll experience a period of mania or hypomania. So these are characterized by things like a, a lack of sleep or a lack of need for sleep, high uh, degrees of uh, high levels of energy, being irritable, being a little bit arrogant or grandiose and thinking that you can kind of take on the world and start a company and solve, you know, problems in quantum mechanics and discover quantum computing and all this kind of stuff. So there's like a lot of grandiosity, a lot of like elevated mood, but also really irritable. Um, not sleeping as much, not eating as much, talking a lot, being a little bit disorganized and confused. So that's really common for like mania or hypomania. Keep in mind that hypomania is basically a less severe form of mania and oftentimes is an adaptive advantage, which is part of the reason why a lot of people that I've worked with really, really dislike being on, on their bipolar disorder medication. Because if you look at, for example, like Ivy League institutions, oftentimes their, patient, their student population will actually be, have... Uh, more bipolar disorder than the average population, and specifically with hypomania. So I remember talking to, when I was uh, training at Massachusetts General Hospital, I had some colleagues who worked at um, Harvard College and MIT Student Health Services. And as I was kind of talking to them, oh, what's it like, you know, working with those with these kids who go to Harvard and MIT? And, and the responses that I got is like, yeah, you know, like we deal with a lot of type 2 bipolar disorder or hypomania. And it turns out that that's actually an adaptive advantage because you can be a really good student if you're fully functional with four hours of sleep a night and you can kind of be a little bit focused, a little bit more energetic. And so a lot of those kids are actually very reluctant to take medication because it makes actually studying harder and they require more sleep. So kind of going back to bipolar disorder, we're talking about long periods of time where your mood is actually really, really low. And so let's talk about a depressive episode for a second. So these are situations where your energy level is low, your ability to concentrate is impaired. You may see changes to your physiology, like low energy, difficulty getting out of bed, sleeping too much, or sleeping uh, actually too little, but being tired all the time. So that, that's kind of what we think about with as a depressive episode. Cognitively, we're also talking a little bit about things like negative self-attitude. So feeling, feeling really guilty, feeling really ashamed about yourself, feeling like other people really don't like you. And that's kind of like persistent. And in the case of a depressive episode, how do you separate that out from, let's say, low self-esteem? So oftentimes with a depressive episode, it's episodic. So that means that there's a period of time where it's discreetly worse. So it's not like your baseline. And also tends to be kind of refractory to other sorts of things. 
So if people encourage you, even if you've got low self-esteem, hopefully you can feel a little bit better. You can feel loved or valued by your friends. Whereas when people are in a depressive episode, the, the kind of love and care of other people seems to kind of bounce off. A couple of other things in depressive episodes, sometimes we'll see things like suicidal ideation or um, a decreased interest in activities. So this is a little bit more specific for a depressive episode, which is something that we call anhedonia, which is the inability to enjoy things that you would normally find pleasurable. So life just kind of feels really gray. It's not as much fun to watch things or play things or hang out with friends. So that's kind of what a depressive episode looks like. The key thing about bipolar disorder is we're, we're experiencing, let's say, a depressive episode for six months, and then we'll experience mania afterward or hypomania. And it's very common for people who experience mania or hypomania to crash afterward and enter a depressive episode. So that's really what we're talking about when we're referring to bipolar disorder. Uh, we're not talking about day-to-day -day mood fluctuations that can happen, but it's really the exception rather than the rule. So then the question kind of becomes, okay, as a clinician, how do we think about treating bipolar disorder? And this is where what I'm going to do is whip out the old trusty iPad and let's understand this, okay? So when it comes to bipolar disorder, what we want to do is understand that medications serve four functions. Oh, that's red. So when it comes to bipolar disorder, medications actually have four different functions. Okay, so let's start by looking at mood. So let's say that this is the baseline mood. Let's say here's, let's take a patient who's got, let's say, three weeks of mania followed by six months of depression. Okay. Actually, I'm going to say three months of depression. Three weeks of mania followed by, let's say, a few months of depression. Okay? So this is the manic phase. This is the depressive phase. So what are the four roles of medication? So one job of medication is to take someone who's manic and bring them to baseline. This is what we call treatment of acute mania. Another thing that we want to do is bring people who are depressed and bring them back to baseline. So this is treatment of acute depression. So these are situations where you've got an active mood disturbance, okay? And we want to bring someone back to normal. So an analogy for this would be like, let's say I've got a fever and then I take like a medication like acetaminophen or ibuprofen. And these are antipyretic medications. The goal is to take a, an abnormal state and bring it back to baseline. The other roles, and this is actually pretty simple. I mean, I can explain it in five minutes. The other thing uh, to remember is that when we're talking about mania, this process is really important. So before we become fully manic, there's this period of time where our mood fluctuates. And this process is really important. So the other thing that uh, medications do is they prevent mood fluctuations, okay? So this is what, what I kind of think of is more chronic or preventive mood stabilization. So there's treatment of acute depression and acute mania, and there's prevention of further episodes. So if we look at things like antidepressant medication, antidepressant medication has a couple of different effects. One is it improves mood acutely, but then it also reduces the frequency and duration and severity of subsequent episodes. Does that make sense? So not only are we doing this piece over here with, let's say, an SSRI, but our goal is to make future mood episodes really small and reduce their duration and frequency over time. 
So what we sort of know is when people are on antidepressant medication, like without antidepressant medication, let's say like you get depressed once a year or once every other year. With antidepressant medication, you get depressed once every four years and it tends to last less time and it's like less bad. So the key thing to remember is that there are acute mania. So when it comes to bipolar disorder, there are medications for acute mania, acute depression, which means a depressive episode, and then also um, preventing mania and preventing depression. So the first thing that I tend to see that, is, honestly, it's kind of bad when clinicians make this mistake, but I see it all too common, is they'll get started on treatments for this stuff, and then they just stay on there. So there are some medications, so like, let's take example, lithium is a really common medication that actually checks all of these boxes. So some medications actually do all four. So it's very reasonable for people to get started on like a particular medication and then just stay on it. But the key thing here is that you should understand why you're using the lithium. In the short term, we may be using it for acute mania and we want it, may want to keep it on. But what I also tend to see, which uh, there's data to support this as well, is a lot of times people will use antipsychotics, especially during the acute portion. So a lot of times first line treatment for acute mania, like severe mania, because sometimes you can even become psychotic while you're manic, is to start someone on an antipsychotic. And the medication works really well, right? So you, you can have a medication like, let's say, olanzapine. And uh, olanzapine is one of the FDA approved medications along with uh, an SSRI. It's one of the FDA approved regimens to treat bipolar disorder in the United States. But oftentimes what I tend to see is that people will stay on olanzapine long term, which is not really my first choice. So this is actually like you can have a check here. It's not what I prefer, but it is an evidence based treatment. OK, so that's like I hopefully all understand that. And why don't I prefer olanzapine as a long term treatment? So olanzapine, for example, tends to cause people to gain about 20 pounds or 10 kgs has, uh, you know, worsens cardiovascular outcomes. So people just gain a lot of weight. Sometimes they feel pretty sleepy. And like, you know, it, it's not good. Like they'll get like pre-diabetes and, and type 2 diabetes and stuff like that if you're on the medication for a long time. So there are good reasons to be on the lanzapine, especially with fluoxetine. I think that, I think that's the, the combination. That's FDA approved for treatment of bipolar disorder. But you have to remember that like some medications work better in the short term and you can stay on in the long term. There's actually data that shows that in terms of algorithms, if something works over here and you can use it over here, that's what you should stay with. Because if you try one thing for this and then move to a different medication for maintenance, sometimes outcomes get worse. But the key thing to kind of think about is that your acute treatment and your chronic treatment are two different things. So then we've got other things like, let's say, lamotrigine. And this is just one doctor's opinion, okay? So this isn't like scientific fact. So then we've also got uh, lamotrigine, which has been shown, in my opinion, to not really work well for preventing mania, but actually works okay for preventing depression. Doesn't really work great, in my opinion, in terms of acute mania or acute depression. So lamotrigine also has the added benefit of working really well for mood lability, which is what we kind of talked about earlier, which is not bipolar disorder, which is like fluctuations in mood on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is just an example of like another medication and how it kind of misses some of these things, but then gets others. And then we've got some really interesting evidence that shows that some medication, like let's say SSRIs, can be used for acute depression, but they don't really work that great, to be honest. They usually take about eight weeks to really kick in and definitely works well for preventing depression, but in some cases may actually increase the risk of developing mania. So this too, there's a lot of debate in the psychiatric community. So in Europe, for example, there are many regions in Europe where they'll, they'll provide, uh, prescribe SSRIs for people with a history of bipolar disorder. They don't think it really worsens the risk of mania. But here in the U.S., we tend to be really, really hesitant around providing SSRIs without a mood stabilizer. So now we get to a couple of, okay, does that make sense? We kind of with you there? 
or you all with me? So let's just kind of review real quick. So when it comes to bipolar disorder, our goal is sometimes acute treatment and then preventive treatment. And these are two totally different things. There are some cases where you have one medication that can do all four. And so if that medication works well for you, totally fine. You can take it. You're kind of done. But oftentimes what we'll end up seeing is that if you look at acute mania, acute depression, and then preventing mania, and preventing depression, you can kind of create a situation where these all kind of like work with each other. So let's say I use an SSRI. Sorry. Let's say I use an SSRI to prevent depression. Now, the problem is if that increases my risk of mania, I may need something like a mood stabilizer. So let's say I use something like carbamazepine. Okay, so that's why I'm kind of getting this. And then, unfortunately, sometimes what will happen is that I'll have olanzapine, which is an anti antipsychotic, which got started because I was acutely manic. And I got discharged from the hospital. They sent me with a prescription because I was supposed to take it for two weeks. It kind of just stays on. And then now what's happened is I've got three medications on that, you know, I, I may not even need. Like, I don't, I may not need the olanzapine anymore because I'm not acutely manic. As long as I've got the carbamazepine and the SSRI, I may be doing okay. So th this is where it's really, really important to think a little bit about, okay, like, is this combination, is this working for me? Do I still need this medication? And the main thing is that, you know, we really need to be careful about stopping these treatments if we no longer need them. And what I tend to find is that, you know, this patient will kind of come in and they'll say like, oh, you know, like... I'm, I'm not doing wet. I feel very, very stressed out. They're still on the olanzapine. And then what'll happen is someone will be like, okay, well, it sounds like you're irritable. It sounds like, like you're having difficulty sleeping. So this medication regimen is insufficient. So let's add another one, right? Because you're symptomatic. Oh, the medications aren't working. And so then what they do is they add lithium. And now we're suddenly on four medications. And this is what tends to happen is that people will just kind of like add stuff on and then we get people who are really over medicated. Also an increasing problem de depending on how like longitudinal care is because sometimes you'll have someone covering and you're seeing this person for this thing and that person for that thing. And then what happens is like, well, like, I don't know if it's like medically, medical legally safe to stop the olanzapine. If someone else started you on it, they must have had a good reason, right? So this is something else that we're seeing is that as more people are like getting cross coverage, people are less likely to take patients off of medication. And then you get passed around from person to person to person, you end up on like five meds. So when it comes to bipolar disorder, you know, if you're trying to think about, okay, can I stop medication? The other thing to consider is that bipolar disorder, remember, is mood fluctuations over time. And if you're thinking about stopping medication, you need to be super, super, super careful because this is what I tend to see. So let's say that we've got our four domains, okay? So someone comes in and says, Dr. K, I want to stop my meds. And this is where I'd say, okay, like, let's, th let's talk about that, right? Let let's try to understand which meds should you stop and which meds should you not stop. Well, okay, what's bothering you the most? I'm sleepy all the time and I'm gaining weight. Okay, fantastic. What we're going to do, let's stop the olanzapine. Uh, but I, I still don't like the way that the lithium makes me feel. I feel less energetic. Okay, well, let's think about that, right? So you've been doing well without being hospitalized, without getting fired, without anything for one year. And now you feel perfectly fine because you're not having manic episodes. You're not having depressive episodes. Your life seems to be going well. And if I'm feeling well, why do I need the medication? Right? And then this is the key thing. Maybe the reason you continue to feel well is because the lithium is on board. So this is another really important thing to understand about bipolar disorders. When we think about medications, we think about medications as fixing something that's messed up, which makes total sense for the acute mania and the acute uh, depressive sides. Right? Now that I'm feeling better, I don't need the olanzapine. Totally fine. I'm with you. You don't need the olanzapine. Let's take it off. But the key thing to remember about bipolar disorder is that some of the medication 
is responsible for you feeling normal. And what people want to do is they want to stop the medication when they're feeling normal. I'm feeling fine now. Why do I need the medication? That's why you feel fine. Because you're getting the medication. And so you really have to be careful about especially taking off the preventive mania and the preventive depression medication. There are still good ways to do that. We'll talk about that in a second. But another example of this, which I see, which is completely unrelated to bipolar disorder, is just to give you all an analogy. So I've had patients, so I worked for a while as an addiction psychiatrist. So I have patients who are like sober for six months. And they're like, yeah, I've been sober for six months. I don't even think about alcohol anymore. I think I'm going to stop going to meetings. And so I'm going to stop seeing my therapist. I'm going to stop going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And then what happens three months later? They relapse. So one thing that I strongly, strongly ask you all to consider, if you're on any kind of psychiatric treatment regimen, if you're feeling to good today, don't stop the stuff that got you here, right? You don't go to the gym for two years, look at yourself in the mirror and be like, wow, I'm really fit. Time to stop going to the gym because I've got it under control now. Maintaining your mental health is an ongoing kind of thing. And I have tapered people and taken uh, patients with bipolar disorder off of medication before. It's actually very possible, depending on the, the patient and stuff. But that's where, frankly, p people who uh, get off of medication usually need to be a lot more disciplined in their regular life. So in my opinion, the most important treatment for bipolar disorder is no medication, is not a medication, but is sleep. The patients who sleep well do so, so, so much better. Because lack of sleep is one of the triggers for a manic episode. Also messes with depression. So this is the kind of thing where like when people come off of bipolar disorder medication, I oftentimes find that they need a more disciplined lifestyle and it's actually harder to manage. So it is possible. Right. And ultimately, like patients, like it's, it's your body. Right. So you should be dictating the treatment. But when it comes to medication, I would be super, super careful about stopping your maintenance medication. But by all means, be aggressive about stopping your acute treatment stuff if you're no longer acutely ill. So this is a, a really common misconception that people have when it comes to bipolar disorder, which is that everyone sort of like starts to get better and then they want to stop their medication, which makes perfect sense. Right now that I'm feeling better, like, why do I need the medication anymore? Right? We only take medication when we're sick because that's how our system of medicine tends to be set up. Like you don't just take chemotherapy because you're feeling well. You take chemotherapy when you've got cancer. You take acetaminophen when you've got a fever. Right? You take antibiotics when you've got an infection. You take blood pressure medication when your blood pressure is high. But with bipolar disorder, there are four discrete roles of medication. Acute treatment of mania, acute treatment of depression, prevention of mania, and prevention of depression. And so when it comes to stopping particular medications, what I tend to find is that a lot of people confuse the acute mania and acute uh, depression treatments with the prevention, uh, prevention of mania and prevention of depression treatments. Not only do patients not understand this, unfortunately, a lot of times providers don't, or doctors don't, or providers, right, because they're more than doctors, don't uh, really understand this as well. And I tend to find that especially there are some providers who are very, very algorithmic with their thinking. Like, if patient walks in with this disease, you treat with this medicine. It's like a very, very simple logic. But in my experience, that actually doesn't lead, uh, work out precisely correct, and that you should always have a thoughtful clinician who's really thinking about, okay, what do each of these medications do for you? And when it comes to stopping them, I think, it, you know, for acute treatments, it's important to actually try to stop those to minimize side effects and things like that. But for your maintenance medications, especially if you're doing well and you've been doing well for like, let's say a year or two, I would seriously consider staying on it just so that you can get some stability under your belt, right? Because just when you're putting your life together, you don't want to fall back into a depression that's six months long. If you're like a junior in college and you like have to repeat one year and now you're kind of like getting everything together, your GPA is going up and stuff like that. I understand that medications have side effects. I'm not saying that they're pleasant or not hard to deal with, but sometimes it's actually worth it to stay on the medication so that you can actually like graduate from college. Because the last thing you need is to start your senior year, get depressed again and lose another six months. And now you have to be in college for six years instead of five. So is that worth going off of the medication? Sometimes not really. 
So I'd encourage all of y'all to think a little bit about, you know, whether when you're on medication to really think about, okay, what is the goal of each of these medications? And you should, if, if you don't know why you're taking a medicine, I strongly, strongly encourage you to talk to your doctor about it and ask them, like, why am I on all this stuff? Like, this stuff is hard for me to take. I want to come off. What do you think about that? And really listen for some kind of like nuanced explanation, right? Because they should have good clinical reasoning for the medications that they provide. And if they can't provide that, then, then I would really challenge that, even consider getting a second opinion. Because sometimes we'll see these like medication lists from hell. It's like we're on six medications for bipolar disorder. Like why on earth are you on these six medications? And at that point, people just start feeling better if you like stop, start taking them off of medications. Like they're so, they've got so many mood stabilizers on there that their like mood is completely flattened. So unfortunately, this is something that I'm seeing more and more where like people are just coming in with piles of medications. Does it mean that you should go off of all of them? Which is oftentimes what patients end up doing, right? Because you're so frustrated because you're tired of being all of this crap and then you just stop it all. And how are you supposed to know if, okay, if I'm on five medications, how am I supposed to know which ones are safe to stop and which ones aren't? I don't. I go talk to my doctor. My doctor's kind of like, eh. And then I decide to uh, take them all off. And then I, my depression comes back. Mania comes back. You know? And then I'm kind of like back to square one. I've lost so much ground. So I strongly encourage you all to understand what the medications you're taking are. Understand what particular goal the medication has and talk to your doctor about all that stuff and really try to figure out, okay, what's the right regimen for you from a risk benefit analysis, right? Even if there are some side effects, what is the minimum amount of medication I need to take in order to be able to accomplish the goals that are really important for me? Because ultimately that's what medication is for, right? Medication is there to help you live the life that you want, not get in the way of living the life that you want. Sometimes you got to make trade-offs. But those the trade-offs should always be intentional and thoughtful. So now we'll open things up to questions. Yeah, so the Bone Zone is saying, I'm seeing a nurse practitioner psychiatrist. They just prescribe whatever, but I'm too poor to see a good doctor. That's unfortunately, I mean, that that is both unfortunate and sometimes common. So I think that this is kind of like an issue where I think we're seeing that there's a shortage of medical providers. So a lot of times people will see not doctors, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I've worked with a ton of nurse practitioners. A lot of them are really good. And unfortunately, like a lot of them aren't. And that too, I don't necessarily blame the nurse practitioners. It's just the kind of training that they get is very different. And furthermore, sometimes what you'll see, I've seen this before too, where you'll have a psychiatrist who will be overseeing a dozen nurse practitioners, but like doesn't actually do any oversight. They just collect a check every single week. So, I mean, it's not like doctors aren't complicit in this kind of stuff too. It, I, it just depends on... On, you know, and so Warhammer, which is saying my NP rocks, I've worked with. So one of the people who inspired me to go into psychiatry was a nurse practitioner, just absolutely awesome nurse practitioner who was on the transplant service at, at the medical school that I went to Tufts for medical school. And she was just really awesome and, and re just an awesome clinician, really thoughtful, taught me so much. And I've seen a lot of nurse practitioners that are not that thoughtful as well. I've seen doctors that way, too, for example. I remember working with one doctor at a community health center who was like, would see like seven patients an hour, spend less than five minutes with each one, and would not really listen to what people have to say. So I think just keep looking for good practitioners. Other questions? Are SSRIs actually effective clinically? I think so. So I think that if y'all, if we're talking about SSRIs, y'all have to remember a couple of things. So when we do studies on things like SSRIs, we're look SSRIs are antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications for the most part. So remember that we're taking like a thousand people, and we're looking at we're averaging the response amongst those thousand people. So the problem with that is that. In that 1,000 people, so let's say there's like a 30% improvement across 1,000 people. 
The thing, though, is if you look at data on SSRIs, they're more effective for people who are more severely ill. And so what, what my experience has been is in that 1,000 people, there are actually three groups. There's about a third of people, let's say 300 people, who respond really, really well to SSRIs, and it like is transformative for them. There's a third of people for whom like it seems to help some, right? So like I'm getting something, but it's not like a life-changing medication for me. And then there's a third of people for whom it kind of doesn't work. And then once we average all those people together, what we end up with is a 30% improvement. But clinically, what I, t I tend to see is not a 30% improvement. I see drastic improvements, moderate improvements, or no improvements. Right? And there's, there's even data to suggest that you can switch SSRIs like two times and you can still get a good treatment response. So the first SSRI may not work, the second SSRI may not work, the third SSRI could still work. But after you've tried a trial of three, usually the likelihood that the fourth, fifth, sixth will work is quite low. You can't take SSRIs when you're bipolar, right? That's not necessarily true. So there are some regional variabilities there about thinking. So like, it, um, you know, based on some European colleagues that I've worked with, they're more likely to prescribe SSRIs to people who are bipolar. The key thing is that... Generally speaking, in the U.S., what's going to happen is if you get started on an SSRI, you may need an anti-manic preventive agent as well. So that's a good example of why you may need two medications, right? Because the SSRI works so well for you on the depression, you may need something else to keep you from becoming manic. So Warhammer, which is saying SSRI combined with low-dose antipsychotic, uh, helped fix 20 plus years of severe depression. I've seen that too. So sometimes the antipsychotic medications will also be used as adjunctive treatments for depression. And Walls of Gab is saying, I take an SSRI with bipolar, but mine has to be with a mood stabilizer or I'll sink. That's a very common experience too. So uh, by the way, I, I really appreciate everyone in, in chat kind of weighing in. Um, just because I, I think these are like, th these are good stories, right? So for, if you're listening to this, like recognize that there are people out there who have, it's taken some time, but they found the right medication for them and they're doing well for years afterward. Bernardo Rocha Nunez is saying, I enjoy the personal experience of hypomania. Most people do, my dude. <laughs> Most people do. That's what makes it so hard to treat. Right? It's hard to treat something that you love. Grandelm is asking, should I talk to my doc about switching SSRIs if my current one makes me feel emotionally numb? Answer is absolutely. So I'll give you all a quick tip. Should I talk to my doctor about dot, 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 dot? Doesn't matter what comes after that. The answer is always yes. Pretty much. I don't know about 100%, but 99% of chance is yes. I, I don't think I can think of a single time where I did not like that my patient asked me about something relating to their treatment, right? Even for the people who are hypochondriacs and will have like million, million, million questions, right? It's my job to help them go work through that kind of stuff. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think someone is trolling me. So scary printer sounds. Should I talk to my doctor about how birds aren't real? So this is where you may be trolling, but honestly, I would love to have a call. Like if my patient thought birds were not real, I would love to hear about it. <laughs> right. That's got to be one of the most interesting conversations that I mean, people can ask me about like whether lithium is the right drug for them and whether they should be on an SSRI as much as they want to. But honestly, the reason I'm in the profession is for questions like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, 
why can't there be more psychiatrists as well informed as you are? I know why it just sucks there isn't. So a couple of things to keep in mind. So the first thing to understand is that when it comes to medical providers, we sometimes think of people as like good doctors or bad doctors or good nurse practitioners or bad nurse practitioners. My experience has been that, first of all, there's a fluctuation in terms of our performance as well, right? So like y'all are catching me on like noon on a weekday where I'm not burnt out. I haven't, I don't have 45 patients scheduled in my clinic over the next two days. So a lot of times, like, it's not just that there are good doctors and bad doctors, but there are good doctor days and bad doctor days. And you may just catch your doctor on a bad day or a nurse practitioner for that matter. Right? So like that, like you just have to try to remember that. And especially when it comes to mental health pra practitioners, like we're all overworked and burnt out. Because the demand is just so high and there's just not enough providers out there. The last thing to consider is that I do think that training could be improved quite a bit, right? So like part of the reason that I know what I know, like I, you know, I didn't learn this stuff. It, the, this, the kind of doctor I am is actually a credit to my teachers. So these are people at like Tufts Medical School that inspired me to go into psychiatry, right? So I did like two or three months of psychiatry there. And then four years of training at Harvard. And like my teachers were amazing. And so why can't more doctors, quote unquote, be like me? So first of all, we've got to make sure that they're taken care of, right? They're not burnt out. They're not overworked. They don't have some clinic director who's pushing them to see 20% more patients so that we see we make 20% more money. There's a lot of stuff that is not ideal in the medical profession. And then the last thing is that I do think that there are, unfortunately, some institutions out there that offer very low quality training. And that's just kind of how it is. Like, unfortunately, that I do think that's the case. And this, is, this isn't, I mean, I think the majority of places offer pretty good training, but there are a lot of places that will, like, pump people out and really just minimize the amount of oversight and clinical thinking that they sort of have. Uh, so Slowmark is saying, my doctor doesn't want to answer my questions about why she switched my Zyprexa to Seroquel. Should I keep asking or just change doctor? She said, I have to trust her, but it's kind of lame. I would, I would push for that. Like you're putting this stuff in your body. I think it's, you're very entitled to a clinical reason for the change. I'd like to understand your clinical reasoning for the medication change. That is the, the phrase that I would use. Now, you have to be a little bit careful because you really got to listen to what they say. Because sometimes what will happen is the patient won't be listening, right? So you've got to be careful about that too, where maybe the doctor has already answered your question. So you, you've got to, you, the other question you can ask is, can you help me understand why you're reluctant to explain it to me? So that's, you have to invite your doctor to also say, hey, like, the reason I'm not giving you explanations is because when I give you explanations, you zone out, you don't pay attention, and you don't seem to really care what I say. I've been in that situation as well, where people are just sort of like unhappy and no amount of clinical reasoning seems to be like processed at all. So you can even ask them, what's your reluctance to explain it to me? Do you find that I'm receptive or not? So I think it's important for you to trust your doctor. That's absolutely true. You should trust your doctor. But trust should not be a substitute for explanation and clinical reasoning. Does that make sense? Like, those things should not, like, it's not, that's not like a true, like, it's like not an either or. Does that make sense? It's not like a multiple choice question where you get to pick trust or clinical reasoning or communicating with your doctor. Those should not be exclusive. They should be hand in hand.
Uh, my therapist wants me out of antidepressants because she thinks I must change my view of myself as a mental patient, but my psychiatrist tells me to wait more time before stopping to take them. Any advice? Yeah, so a couple things. One is that if your therapist and your psychiatrist are giving you contrary advice, they should talk to each other. They should be talking to each other in general. Um, and the second thing is I, I would ask your therapist what they think about antidepressants in general. Because one of the, the really unfortunate things is that a lot of therapists are not, or most therapists are not trained in psychopharmacology. So they don't, many of them don't, you know, that's just not a part of their training. So they don't prescribe medications. So you've got to be really careful. Like I personally think, so I, I'm sort of like, so I tend to be all about holistic medicine and all that good stuff, but I think science is important and data is important. And the, ther you, they, the therapist may have a good reason for saying what they kind of say. And, but, uh, you know, I think that like, this is really something that your clinicians should be talking about. You can also ask them for their understanding of like, view of myself as a mental patient. I don't know if you view yourself as a mental patient, but that can be harmful. Okay, let's move on. I, I think we've uh, got a couple of other things to go over. All great questions, y'all. Really appreciate them. So next up, okay. All right. Okay. Let's take a look at our next post. Um, am I watching TI? I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to. No spoilerinos, please. I'm going to stop looking at chat. Moving on. I'm behind. Let's put it that way. Okay, so next up. Let us take a look at what's next. Let's see what's, what we got coming. Bop, bop, bop. So how do you start believing in yourself like you're capable, understanding your strengths and working on your weaknesses? Basically, how do you become the best version of yourself? I'm a 26-year-old male, but all my life I never believed in myself because that phrase never made sense to me such as having faith in yourself and walking with a purpose in life. I feel honestly disconnected with myself because I feel like I'm a very soft and insecure person. I've been called soft and weak and slow, which I feel internally true because I turned this way. I don't know why. I feel like the world is so competitive and I'm not participating. Instead, I'm sitting and watching life go by and, and dwelling on it. I feel like a letdown and a loser. I understand I'm overthinking and emotionally draining by all the worries, and I want to work on my goals and facing my fears, but I don't know why I don't take action. I want to become a better, stronger, smarter version of myself. I want to turn my weaknesses into strengths. So sometimes we view ourselves as like weak, right? Like, I'm, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. Which is like totally normal because like we're not perfect, right? So then when we look at our weaknesses and we say, I'm insecure, I'm soft, I'm weak, those become a roadmap for success. Those are the things I need to change about myself in order to become the person that I want, right? Because people are like, okay, so like I'm not perfect and let me become the best version of myself. And how do I do that? I look at all the areas in which I'm weak and I fix all those things. And if I fix everything that's wrong with me on the inside, I will become the super version of myself. Makes sense, right? Obviously, like if I'm undisciplined, I'm going to become disciplined. If I'm out of shape, I'm going to get in shape. If I don't eat healthy, I'm going to start eating healthy. If I'm, if I'm introverted, I'm going to learn how to be social. So we look at ourselves and sometimes we see that there's a lot that's lacking on the inside. And then we kind of think, okay, I need to fix all these things and then I will be happy. Makes perfect sense. 
The problem is that it doesn't work, right? Because if you look at people who kind of do this, what they end up with is like, they end up, if this is the way that you think about yourself, you end up sitting on the sidelines and just watching life go by. You recognize there's all kinds of stuff that you're supposed to fix. You're like, okay, if I was better in this way, if I was better in this way, if I was better in this way, if I was better this way. Then you could fix those, like, like you hope that you'd be able to fix those things and then you'd be happy. But when you think that way, what ends up happening is that you lose motivation. You just kind of watch life go by and you don't really fix it, right? Even though you need to. And so then what people will kind of notice is you're kind of like, you're sitting there, you're trying to figure out, okay, like, how do I improve my life? How do I fix this? Whatever. And then what happens is you realize, okay, there are some people who have faith in themselves, right? That Maybe that's the missing element. Like, clearly I have like low self-esteem and I don't believe in myself. And there are people out there who like believe in themselves. And when they believe in themselves, they're able to try. And then failures don't become failures, they become setbacks, right? I turn a failure into a setback if I believe in myself. And so then the question kind of becomes, all right, so like I need to have faith in myself. Well, how do I do that? And now, so that now what I'd love to share with you all is like conversations that I've had with people who don't have faith in themselves. So here's how the conversation goes. So they'll come in, they'll say, Dr. K, help me. Like, how do I start believing in myself? And so I was like, well, I was like wow, that's a really good question. How do you start believing in yourself? And then I'll ask them and they're like, I don't know, bro. That's why I came to you. And I'm like, okay, fine. Fair enough. Let's start with this. What does it mean to believe in yourself? What does that actually mean? Be like, I don't know. It means having faith in myself. Be like, okay. So what does it mean to have faith in yourself? Like, what does that like mean on a daily basis? What's different about the way that you think? What's different about the way that you act? Wh like, what does it, like, what are the pieces of faith in yourself? And they say, well, it means that I have confidence in myself. Right? So like, I lack confidence. I'm like, okay, cool. So what does it mean to be confident in yourself? They're like, I don't know. It means to believe in myself. And so there's like a circle of synonyms that they use when no one really understands what it means to have faith. Like, what does that mean? Right? Like, what, like, show it to me, draw it out, create a diagram. What does it mean to have faith in yourself? So let's start there because once you realize what having faith in yourself really means, then instead of this vague thing that I should have, it can actually be something that you can strive for. But what, like, you don't even know what you're really looking for, right? So how would you define having faith in myself, believing in myself? How do you define believing in yourself? Confidence. How do you define confidence? Believing in yourself, faith in yourself. No one really understands. So let's understand this first. If I want to take an action, let's say I have a goal. As I move towards the goal, there are a thousand things that could go right and a thousand things that could go wrong. Okay? So let's say I want to apply to college. If I want to apply to a college, like someone could look at my application and be impressed or someone could look at my application and be unimpressed. People could dislike my name. They could love my name. They could really like my humorous attitude or they may find that my humorous attitude is irreverent and disrespectful. So anytime we're trying to do something in life, stuff can go in our favor or it can go not in our favor. So the biggest difference, if I had to say, like, if I've, as I've talked to a bunch of people who lack faith in themselves and have faith in themselves, the biggest difference is all the question marks in people who don't believe in themselves become negatives. And people who believe in themselves, those question marks become positives. I don't know if that kind of makes sense, but like of the thousand things that go wrong, when you don't have faith in yourself, in your mind, you think all of those thousand things will go wrong. I'll go in for the interview and people won't like the way they look. They'll think I'm fat. They'll think I'm ugly. They'll think I lack confidence. All of these things that could go wrong in your mind start to go wrong. And when you believe in yourself, you're like, eh. Like, you know, that stuff could happen, but like, I'm going to go there. I'm going to do the best that I can. They may like it, not like it, whatever. I'm going to like offer what I have and like, hopefully things kind of end up okay. So that's the key. The biggest difference in my mind between believing in yourself and not believing in yourself is in the thousands of variables that your mind is calculating, whether things work out for you or don't work out for you. When you don't believe in yourself, you start to think that anything that could go wrong will go wrong. And so as you start thinking, okay, this stuff is going to go wrong, 
then what does your brain tell you to do? It tells you don't bother because it's a waste of your time. They're not going to like you anyway, right? And then we see the lack of confidence. And so what ends up happening is this. I'm not participating. Instead, I'm sitting and watching life go by because there's no point in participating when everything is going to go wrong and it's all going to come falling apart, right? That's what it means to not believe in yourself. So like, think about it for a second. I want to write a, I want to write a novel and I believed in myself. And so I wrote the novel and then I sent it to a publisher and the publisher rejected it. And I believed in myself. So a real thing went wrong, right? And then I sent it to someone else and then they rejected it. And then I believed in myself and I sent it to a third person and they accepted it. Now, if you don't believe in yourself, the first rejection you get, no point in trying. Do y'all see that? So faith in yourself means that the rest of the world, things could go in your favor or not go in your favor, but you're going to continue trying, even though success is not guaranteed. Paradoxically, when people lack faith in themselves, what they usually look for in order to act is a guarantee of success. People who don't believe in themselves are more likely to cheat than they are to study. Because if I can cheat, then I'm sure I'm going to get an A. But if I study, who knows? Maybe the stuff that I didn't study winds up on the test, right? I, I spent so much time studying this 90% of the material, and the 10% that I didn't study ends up being the, and I'm screwed anyway. Now, an interesting thing is that we can sort of look at the opposite of this, which is sometimes we'll look at people who are very, very entitled, right? And people who are very entitled are almost, they, they don't really have faith in themselves, but they kind of have faith. Because sometimes you'll have people who, let's say I failed a class and my parents made a big donation to the school and then lo and behold, I end up getting an A. So what kind of lesson does that person learn? That person learns that they sort of have faith in themselves that no matter what I do, if I do something, the rest of the world will conform to my wishes. And Eve, I can half-ass it and I'll still get a job, right? Because my dad is the owner of the company. And so th that sense of entitlement is almost the opposite of lacking faith in yourself, where all the things that could go wrong for people who are very entitled, they think they will go right. I'm the best thing since sliced bread. Everyone's going to love me. I'm going to get promoted. I'm the smartest person in the world. That can sometimes cross over into narcissism. I really think about it more as entitlement. Because narcissism tends to actually have insecurity at its core. That's the other thing to just consider for a second. Okay, so now the question becomes, all right, so like, let's say I lack faith in myself. What do I do about it? Okay, so what tends to happen, let's try to understand what the cycle of this looks like, okay? So we're going to move over to this for a second. So let's look at the strategy of someone who doesn't believe in themselves. So what happens when someone doesn't believe in themselves? So I have, let's say, low confidence. And I have a goal over here. I'm going to move towards this goal, but just to kind of illustrate this. And at each point, I have a branch point. Or like along the way, I have a bunch of branch points. So this is something I could get lucky, I could get lucky, I could get lucky, I could get lucky. And if this happens and my total is greater than three, then I win. I don't know if this kind of makes sense to y'all. But when you lack confidence in yourself, you think about all the stuff that could go wrong. And now you end up with a negative four, which is going to be a loss. Right? And like, realistically, they could like you or dislike you. So this is the difference between faith in yourself and not having faith in yourself is that you assume all the stuff that could go wrong will go wrong, okay? So then what happens is you see all these negatives and you start to think about all these low qualities. Like, okay, I'm undisciplined. Let's say I'm unattractive. Let's say I'm not intelligent. Low charisma whatever. And then you look at these and, and you kind of look at this stuff and you say like, okay, these things are going to be my roadmap. This is what I have to fix 
to become the best version of myself. Now, the problem is that as we think of ourselves as this, this actually becomes a form of self-sabotage and leads to all of these things. Okay, I'm going to tell you all a quick story. So when I finished medical school, I was a competitive candidate. So I did well. I like won some awards and whatnot. And so I, I had an interview at one particular institution. And I liked the institution. They're a good institution. I went and I talked to the program director, right? So like I'm interviewing there for a position. And he was like, I don't understand why you're here. And I was like, what do you mean? I, well, you don't understand why I'm here. Like, you could get interviews wherever you want to. Like, why are you coming to us? And I was super confused. Like, I was like, I'm here because I thought your institution was good. Like, I, I applied because I've heard wonderful things about it. And I liked the kind of attitude. Like, I was super into complementary alternative medicine, as you all know. And so this institution was in a part of the U.S. that's very, very, like, CAM-focused. And so I sort of said that. I was like, I think the city's fantastic. I've heard good things about your institution. Like, you know, it, it ranks well and stuff like that. And the dude was like, you know, you belong somewhere else. That's what was, he lacked confidence and was like, you deserve better than us. We get all the rejects. And boy, did that become a self-fulfilling prophecy because I was like, bro, I don't know if I actually want to go there. It created a bias in my head, which I realized later, that when, then when I like went and socialized with the, the residents there, they all seemed like super, super like scuffed. Like they were like burnt out and overworked and like didn't seem the brightest or the nicest or the funnest. And it kind of became the self-fulfilling prophecy because when you put, you know, when you don't think you're worth a whole lot and then you go to interview for a job or you like, you know, ask someone out on a date and you let all that lack of confidence bleed through, this starts to become a reality. So what do you do about this? Okay, so the first thing to understand is awareness. So you have to catch what your mind actually creates. So your mind will create certain thoughts. So a good example of this is how you respond to compliments. So when someone says, hey, Anon, <laughs> you're really good at this. Notice what your mind does. Chances are your mind automatically rejects the compliment. Okay? Next thing to consider is a case of the yes buts, okay? So when you do something successful, when you actually succeed, look for the but afterward. When someone says, hey, congratulations, you graduated from college. That's sort of like a compliment, right? It's not really a compliment, but like anytime you succeed, look for the but. Yeah, but here is a reason why I undervalue my own achievement. That's what, what tends to happen. So you'll notice that you're, sometimes your mind will do this. Like you'll undervalue it. Like if, if people are like, hey, congratulations, you won the Olympics. And then you're like, yeah, but I used steroids. And then, like, in that moment, your mind doesn't realize that the 19 other people that were competing also used steroids. <laughs> right? So we'll undervalue our achievements when we've got low confidence. And then, uh, kind of related to this, is... Well, these are almost like two different things. But sometimes you'll kind of find that any kind of positive thought... There, there'll always be a but as well. So when you look at, um, actually, I, I guess this is, this kind of is two, actually, but let me just think about this for a second. So anytime that you have a positive kind of sentiment about yourself, this will turn into a but. 
Like if someone said, if you think that, oh, okay, like I did this really well, your mind will quickly say, but, but this, but this, but this. Okay. So these are, this is what you have to look out for. And now I want you all to think about this. Let's say I have, let's say here's my self-esteem level. Okay. Let's say I'm right here. And what causes self-esteem to go up when people appreciate you? So someone used compliment and then now self-esteem rises. But when we reject this, we still stay here. And then when we achieve something, what should happen? Achievement leads to an increase in confidence. Wow, I can be proud of myself. But then we undervalue it. So we stay down here. And then anytime we kind of notice a positive sentiment within our own mind, like, hey, I'm really good at this, that should increase our confidence. But then we have the but, which knocks it out. And so what we can see here is like, how do you develop confidence in yourself? You start by stopping these things. You start by stopping the reflexive reactions of your mind. And this is based, uh, th this is verified by clinical science, right? So in the field of cognitive behavioral therapy, there are these things called automatic thoughts. And when we do therapy to stop people from, or explore those automatic thoughts, and even to a certain degree stop that kind of thinking, then it actually shows that like people have a clinical improvement. Right, but th this is this is actually this is way predates cognitive behavioral therapy. So thousands of years ago, the yogis in ancient India discovered something called the samskar. And what a samskar is is it's a thought generating machine. And so what tends to happen is we have experiences which lead to a sense of identity. Let's say here's our conscious mind. Here's our subconscious mind. And then this identity creates thoughts on the surface, right? It's like a thought generating machine. And you'll notice this because like what will happen is this identity, when someone from the outside gives us a compliment, what will happen is the, the identity will reject the compliment, right? Instead of taking it in, it'll bounce it off. And so how do we, how, literally, how do we stop this? We stop this first by noticing these things and say, wow, like my mind is, like, it's really hard for me to like accept a compliment. And instead, what I want y'all to learn how to say is no matter what they say, just say thank you. That's very kind of you. When it comes to your own successes, there may be particular things that your mind comes to, but this is where, this also works for imposter syndrome, by the way, is anytime you achieve something, even if your mind says, yeah, we got lucky. But then what you can do is respond and kind of ask yourself, like, okay, we may have gotten lucky, but what did we do to improve our chances? Who we lucked out that that last segment, segment of biochemistry wasn't on the test. Yeah, we sure did. But it's kind of nice that we studied everything except for that, isn't it? So catch your thoughts. And what tends to happen in the way that this kind of works is that our mind is kind of like, if y'all were in, caught our group coaching stream, this will kind of be refresher. So our mind kind of like lays down a track of thought. And then the more that we think something, the more that track of thought gets enhanced, enhanced, enhanced. And the key thing here is that we think about habits as actions, but you can be a habitual thinker as well. So if you know someone who's a conspiracy theorist, you'll see how their thoughts are like very, very like well-grooved, right? It's kind of like creating a trail that is now very, very easy to walk down. And so what we've got to do is start by catching our thoughts. And the other thing to think about is when we start saying thank you and we stop undervaluate, uh, undervaluing our own achievements, there's another word for this, which is self-compassion. We got to talk about this for a second. Because if you're not careful, you'll be compassionate towards yourself. 
And then you may say, but Dr. K, shouldn't I be compassionate towards myself? And it's like, yeah, you should, but you don't want to. And then the question is like, why on earth wouldn't I want to be compassionate towards myself? Well, let's think about this. Let's say you have a task. You have a goal over here. And the goal doesn't go your way and you end up failing. Now you've got a couple of options. If you're self if you practice self-compassion, you're like, "Oh, it's okay. You know, you tried your best. Good job, bro." A good job, girl. As you fail and you practice self-compassion. Actually, let's do it this way. What does failure plus self-compassion result in? What people think it results in is a lack of motivation. Right? Because what keeps you going? This stuff. These are all the things that I need to fix. And if I practice self-compassion, then I don't have to fix those things. If I forgive myself for being undisciplined, how am I ever going to become undisciplined? If I forgive myself for being unattractive, how am I ever going to become attractive? If I forgive myself for being lazy, how will I ever achieve? So this is really important. Why is it so hard to be self-compassionate? Because we confuse self-compassion with complacency. We start to think that if I'm compassionate towards myself, then I won't make any improvements because I'll accept it. Right? Because self-compassion is kind of like acceptance. And if I accept that I'm undisciplined, then like, how am I ever going to change? We think that acceptance and change can't come hand in hand. In fact, what drives us to change is a lack of acceptance. We say, I don't want to be undisciplined anymore. That's what I need to change. And so why on earth would I accept that? Why on earth would I forgive myself? Why on earth would I forgive myself? for not participating in life. I don't want to forgive myself for that. I want to hate myself for that. I want to hate myself for watching on the sidelines instead of actually living. Right? Because that's what needs to be fixed. If I accept myself, how on earth, if I accept my weaknesses, how can I turn them into strengths? How can I become a smarter, stronger version of myself if I practice self-compassion and I forgive myself for being who I am? So I know it's kind of weird, but let's understand this. Strategy A. Strategy B. So strategy A is low confidence. Want to be the best version. And what does the strategy lead to in action? Strategy B. I know it's confusing. Self-compassion. Noticing. What does this lead to? Being okay with not being the best. Ask yourself this question if you're listening to this. Am I okay not being the best? What do you think this leads to? What people think it leads to is apathy. Because then how am I going to change? If I'm okay with being mediocre, how on earth am I going to change? But the truth of the matter is that this strategy, forget about whatever logic you think is going on, this strategy leads to inaction. And paradoxically, what everyone says, which is confusing as hell to us, is that this actually leads to action, which is absolutely true. But in order to participate in it, you can't do this unless this part right here, in order for you to do this, you must understand this whole compassion and self-compassion piece. Because that's what's going to stop you. When you try to accept responsibility for your achievements, when you try to stop devaluing yourself, this thing will pop up. And it'll say, don't 
devalue. Uh, don't stop devaluing yourself. Keep devaluing yourself because if we need that devaluation to drive us to become better, I'm tired of being here. I don't like where I am. I don't deserve self-compassion. And why don't you deserve self-compassion? Because you lack confidence in yourself in the first place. You don't believe in yourself in the first place. It becomes a vicious cycle. It's so weird. Because the mind that does not understand how to love itself assumes that acceptance equals apathy. The truth of the matter is that it's completely the opposite. And it's just confusing as all hell until you learn how to love yourself. It's confusing, but watch out for this pitfall because it's a huge pitfall. The biggest reason that people aren't able to develop faith in themselves is because the process of developing faith in yourself a part of your mind is terrified of because it, it means complacency to a part of your mind. It's not actually what it is. But it's a really important pitfall. So, how do you start believing in yourself? It's a good question. You start by, first of all, understanding what it means to believe in yourself, right? What are we actually striving for? And this is what I'll leave you all with. If you don't believe yourself, there are all these things that you want to do, right? You have hopes, you have dreams. And anytime you actually try to do them, your mind pops up with all these thousand reasons why it's not going to work. Imagine what it would be like if you have a, had a dream to accomplish something and your mind was like, yeah, let's go. We can do it. How are we going to do it? Who should we ask for help? This is fantastic. Let's wake up. Tomorrow, let's sketch things out tonight, wake up tomorrow morning, and like, let's get started. Or better yet, let's get started now. Imagine what it would be like if your mind, instead of sabotaging you, was like your biggest cheerleader. And was like, let's go. That's what it means to have faith in yourself. For your mind to actually be on your side instead of sabotage you before you even get started. That's what you should strive for. And how do you do that? By noticing the automatic things in your mind which push away self-confidence. When someone compliments you, reject it. Anytime there's a positive thought, look for the but. Yeah, I'm, I'm good at math, but my parents are both math teachers, so I don't deserve credit. And related to that, is watch how you devalue your accomplishments because your mind will do it suddenly. It'll devalue your accomplishments when people compliment you, when you think particular things, because you've achieved some things. There's some things that you've done that are really, really good. Right? Even if you've been depressed for like the last year and you woke up today and cleaned up the kitchen. And then like, that's an achievement, but do you think of it as an achievement? No. Because that's so pathetic. Like I couldn't like, it took me a year to clean my kitchen. So pathetic. And so this person is talking about turning their weaknesses into strengths. But the problem when you lack confidence and you devalue yourself is you turn your wins into losses. And when all of your wins become losses, what do you think that does for your confidence? And the last thing is as you embark on this journey, you've got to be really careful about a pitfall, which is the pitfall of self-compassion which is that it's all of these things that we suck at which drive us forward, which push us to accomplish. And in order to do those, in order to accept accomplishment, I mean, in, in order to accept compliments and value our accomplishments, we have to practice some degree of self-compassion. And why is that hard? Because if you really pay attention, practicing self-compassion, there's a part of your mind that thinks that self-compassion equals complacency. Because if I forgive myself for being undisciplined, how am I ever going to change? I don't deserve forgiveness for that. Like, what are you talking about? I need to be better. Then I can love myself. Let me change first, and then I can love myself. This is not worth loving. Are you 
crazy, bro? Let me become a better human being. Then y'all can love me all you want. But with this current state of my life, what are you talking about? This doesn't deserve love. And the problem is that that strategy is what leads you to inaction. And so as paradoxical it is, you've got to learn self-compassion. You've got to realize that actually, I know it sounds completely insane, it's totally fine to be exactly where you are. You have to accept where you are. You have to practice self-compassion. Only way to get out of this. And it's going to feel so infuriating to even try. And I get that, which is exactly why we're pointing it out to you. So it's challenging to have faith in yourself. But what's the alternative? I mean, like, you got to think about, like, unless you do this, like, what's the alternative, right? If you practice self-love, maybe it'll lead to complacency. Maybe it'll lead to action. Even if you fear it leads to the complacency, the truth of the matter, it doesn't. Because when you start loving yourself, what happens? That's where we go back to having faith in yourself. When you wake up and you love yourself, you're like, all right, let's go. It doesn't matter that I have all these disadvantages. It doesn't matter. I believe in myself, so let's go. And what that sort of means, I don't know if this kind of makes sense, but like, how can I say this? The idea of it doesn't matter what disadvantages I have, let's go, that has to start with self-love. Because your love of yourself at that point is not based on those external things. Does that kind of make sense? Like, that self-compassion is accepting yourself no matter what. Because if your love for yourself is based on your performance, then that's going to fluctuate. And then we end up with kind of strategy A, which is lack of self-confidence, need to change, and I can love myself at the end. But that actually leads to inaction. It's actually accepting yourself no matter what that actually leads to inspiration and forward movement. And even if you think about some of your upbringing, like think about if you had someone in your life who believed in you no matter what. The people in your life that believe in you no matter what, are those the people that lead you to complacency? Of course not. They're the ones that actually inspire you, right? When you fail time and time and time again, and someone's like, I know you can do it. It's hard. I believe in you. How can I help? Let's go. Those are the people that actually drive you forward. And now I want you all to think about this for a second. Who do you have in your head? Who do you carry with you? Someone who loves you and believes in you and says, no matter what happens, I believe in you. Keep trying, bro. You got this. Or keep trying, girl. You got this. Or someone who says you're not good enough and you don't deserve love. And once you become a perfect human being, then I will consider loving you. Which one actually inspires you to act? Just think about it for a second. Because once you realize it, you'll realize it has to start with self-compassion. Questions? So Velvet, uh, Kate is asking, how do you believe in yourself no matter what? So it literally starts the way that I told y'all, which is catch the thoughts in your head. That is the tiniest thing. Believing in yourself no matter what starts with believing in yourself in a very particular instance. Does that make sense? Because no matter what is like all the time. So it starts with like, okay, believing in yourself for a tiny setback, accepting Praise for some kind of accomplishment. That's how it starts. That's how. Is self-love, ego love, or is self different from ego or a humkar? Those are all excellent questions. Worthy of a whole lecture, which we'll talk about at some point. Uh... We're going to teach it. We're definitely going to do meditation today. Okay, so Justin Toons is saying, what if you don't have accomplishments? <laughs> okay, what a great question. Okay, we're going to move on after this. 
So, what defines an accomplishment? What if I don't have accomplishments, Dr. K? What if I genuinely have nothing to be proud of? So here's the thing. When you don't love yourself and you lack confidence in yourself, there's a line. Above the line is accomplishments. Below the line is things that are not considered accomplishments, right? It's not an accomplishment to wake up every day and like brush your teeth. Like that's not an accomplishment. So some people will say, but Dr. K, what if I have nothing above here? To which I'd ask you, what determines where the line gets drawn? How did you decide that the line is here as opposed to here or here? And if you really look into it, what you'll discover is that if you lack confidence in yourselves, there's a very easy, I can tell you exactly how you drew the line. Very simple. The line is drawn based on what you haven't done. Everything that you already do, you're going to devalue. That's not a real accomplishment. Whatever I can do, I'm going to just draw the line right past that. So what if you don't have accomplishments? Of course you have accomplishments. Everyone has accomplishments. There is no human being on the planet who has not accomplished something. Question is, why did you choose that that was not an accomplishment? How did you determine that? And it is the lack of confidence, it is the devaluing of accomplishments which, which causes people, but like logically, like what if I don't have accomplishments? What if I've really accomplished nothing in life? Well, of course you've accomplished something. You're not like a complete waste of space, right? So it's tricky, really tricky. But therein lies the problem, is how you define an accomplishment. And oftentimes what happens with people with low self-confidence is they'll keep on moving the goalposts too. So yeah, I haven't gotten a job, I've never been on a date, I've never been kissed. And then what happens is like, you get your first job. And then it's like, but I've never, I've never been on a date and I've never been kissed, I haven't accomplished anything. Because even when you accomplish something, right, it used to be something that was, it was a reason why you're not a good person. And then when you do it, what does your mind say? Your mind is like, yeah, but I started, I got my first job at the age of 24. People are starting, Bill Gates started Microsoft at 18. So it's not a real accomplishment. So your mind like does these mental gymnastics to devalue what you accomplish. Right? Does that make sense? It's an excellent question. Rhino Gator saying, I feel like I'm just playing myself and just doing copium when I don't call myself out. That's exactly what I'm saying. The reason people don't develop compassion for themselves is because they don't want to. They don't want to. Okay? Thanks for the friendly reminder about time, Tech Teller. Okay, we're going to do one um, where I think we're, let's go one more. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about productivity. Even the term copium is like an indicator of this whole thing. Y'all get that? Because when you call self-compassion copium and you devalue self-compassion by calling it copium, it's like a masterstroke by the Machiavelli of your mind. Do you all get that? It's like, yeah, like, let's devalue caring about ourselves. How do we do that? Yeah, we're going to call it copium. Okay. So I wasted five to six hours watching YouTube, and now I don't want to do anything anymore. So I've, I have some homework that I needed to do over the weekend, but instead of utilizing my time to do stuff, I just blew five hours watching YouTube, and now I hate myself, and I don't feel like I deserve anything or anyone. 
I've tried to be productive several times, and now that has failed, I don't want to do anything anymore. I want to be perfect like everybody else when it comes to their lives, but I find that hard, and I want to cry when I can't do anything that other people can do. I hate my life because I am worth nothing, and I feel like I am incapable of everything that is presented to me. I want to get rid of this thing of not being productive and all that. This happens frequently as well, and I'm hopeless about it. I hate life. So, sometimes, instead of doing what we need to do, we end up watching lots of YouTube or something else, right? Play video games, spend time on Reddit, like whatever, whatever. Pick your poison. The truth of the matter is, though, sometimes it's like we have stuff that we want to accomplish and YouTube kind of gets in the way. And... Then what happens is when we, like, slip up, right, by, like, five hours of YouTube, we hate ourselves. And then we don't feel like we deserve anything. We want to be perfect, but we're the very opposite of perfect. Our mind becomes very, very black and white. It's like, I can't believe I wasted a whole day. I want to get rid of this thing. I'm tired of not being productive anymore. I want to be productive again. Help me be productive again. So what do we do in this situation? So as I was kind of reading this, my first thought is, well, I wonder what's going on in someone's brain. So I didn't really know. I was like, okay, what does watching five hours of YouTube do to your brain? So I know like long-term effects of chronic technology usage, social media usage, video games, things like that. But at the five hour mark, what's going on in someone's brain? So the first thing that I did is I asked that question. And the answers that I, I, I saw were actually terrifying. So the first thing that we're going to do is just like do a quick dip into neuroscience. Okay. So there's some, we're going to talk about, oh yeah, so let's start with this. So there's this field called consumer neuroscience, which terrifies me as a psychiatrist. Because what this means is that there's like a group of people out there who are studying the brain using things like psychometrics, functional neuro neuroimaging, and behavioral data to figure out how to get you to like buy stuff and continue using the internet. Okay? So the impact of motivation to watch YouTube, subjective norms, behavioral control, information success model to watching YouTube engagement. Now, this is important. Me measuring dorsolateral prefrontal cort cortex signals to predict the success of merchandising e elements at the point of sale. Brain activity forecasts video engagement in an internet attention market. So here's something that terrifies me. Your free will is now known as the internet attention market. And there's a lot of research out there about how to get people to like, how to like take this internet attention market and like engage people with it and sell things. Okay. Now this is what's really interesting. So the key thing that I kind of took away from this that I thought was a little bit different is a lot of research on the anterior insula. So let's try to understand the neuroscience real quick. So here's what I, I thought of when I, I looked at this. I was like, okay, I can understand that people get distracted and they don't want to, you know, start doing homework. It's boring. So you open up YouTube because you feel a little bit distracted. But then what I got kind of curious about is why do we waste five hours on YouTube? Because it's not even fun after the first hour. What's going on there? And that's when I sort of discovered that there's all kinds of interesting stuff. And one of the key pieces of neuroscience here is the anterior insula. And the anterior insula is actually heavily involved with, like, insight. Um, it's also involved with the orgasm, which is kind of interesting. Um, but it in, involves, like, it involves a lot of, like, awareness. And, like, a lot of our consciousness comes from the anterior insula. So when we're kind of thinking about, Okay, like, what do I want to do when we're, like, regulating ourselves, when we think a particular way about ourselves, 
like a lot of this like emotional awareness of what we're doing and like being conscious is the anterior insula. And what we know from all this commercial neuroscience is that buying things online and spending more time on the internet is inversely correlated with anterior insular activity. So what that sort of means is that the more aware I am, the less likely I am to engage in with YouTube for five hours at a stretch. And actually what tends to happen is as we use technology, what this internet attention market is doing is finding ways to make us less aware. And what do I mean by finding ways to make us less aware? So when I watch a particular video, so right now, like I'm aware of my surroundings, what I need to do today. My mind is tracking all kinds of stuff. When I watch a video, the engagement level of that video is in how much it allows me to forget. Right? So my, you know, poison of the month this, this month is watching these like, like survival catching foraging, eating, cooking things with fires, right? It's like some dude who's like out in the wilderness who's like making fires and catching things and, and hunting for food and stuff like that. And it's like, that's like when I watch that video for 30 minutes, like I completely forget about everything else that's going on in my life. And my anterior insula shuts down. And there's data that shows that the less active your anterior insula is, the more likely you are to engage in this internet attention marketplace, the more likely you are to watch YouTube for hour four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is like the first thing that you've got to understand is that if you're in this situation and you're blaming yourself for being so lazy instead of being so motivated, like I don't think you really realize how outgunned you really are. Did you get a little distracted? Sure. But there's a whole emerging field of consumer neuroscience, which people are publishing papers about and having conferences on and things like that, where people are like literally learning, like, I, like this is terrifying. I'm going to just show you all this again. Like, look at this. This one. I don't know if y'all... So, you know, we're using neuroimaging to figure out how to engage people with point of, sale, uh, point of sale devices, right? It's kind of weird. Like there's so much stuff going on here that's super terrifying. So now let's try to understand a little bit about, okay, if I want to like, let's go back to the issue at hand, which is I need to do homework and I can't because I got distracted on YouTube for five hours. So we're going to break this apart into a couple of things. The first thing is why do we start watching something or start engaging with technology? The second thing is why do we persist in engaging with technology? The third thing is what does long-term engagement with technology do to our brain and our motivation and our self-esteem? And how do we pull everything, to, how do we kind of tie everything together at the end, okay? So first thing, why do we start using technology? Very, very, very well understood. I feel incredibly confident in what I'm about to say. When I'm trying to do homework, I don't want to do the homework, but chances, whether I do the homework or don't do the homework actually depends on my internal emotional state. The more confident in myself I feel, the less fatigued I am, the less, uh, the, the more I care about myself and the more positive emotions I feel, the more likely I am to do the homework. How do we know this? Well, we know that when we reach for technology, what it tends to do is suppress our negative emotional circuitry. And so generally speaking, the worse we feel about ourselves, the more likely we are to use technology. The more fatigued we are, the more likely we are to use technology. This is part of the reason why, especially like a lot of these financial decisions are getting worse. So if you look at people who are like buying crypto or Wall Street bets or even like online gambling sites, the reason these, all three of these things are so successful from a provider standpoint. We're not talking about the purchaser. We're talking about like the exchange or, you know, like, like day trade, uh, sorry, retail trading, like Robinhood or like all these things are so successful because they allow you to make decisions when you're fatigued. So it used to be that markets were open only at a particular time. So if you wanted to make a trade, you had to open it, like you had to like go through some, some hoops 
as well as there was a particular time that you had to make trades. So you couldn't be like drunk at 3 a.m. in the morning and spend $100,000 by buying some memes, meme stock. But what we've discovered is that as our brains become more dysregulated and as we can make purchases in the wee hours of the morning, when we're drunk, when we're high, when we're tired, whatever, it leads us to make bad purchases. And people are profiting off of this. So your engagement with technology doesn't just have to do with laziness or discipline or you sucking at life. It has to do with a lot of like the state of your mind, your internal emotional state, your fatigue state, all those kinds of things. That's why we start using. And what our brain has figured out is I feel bad about myself. Let me engage in this technology, which will self-soothe and shut down my negative emotional circuitry. Then what happens? That's how we start using technology. Then what happens? Like, why do we end up using technology for five hours? So as technology becomes more engaging, we start to see suppression of the anterior insular cortex, which is our awareness. So then we don't realize that one hour became two, became three, became four, became five. And I love this personally in the turn-based strategy games. Right? So if you guys play turn-based strategy game, you'll understand this very well. One more turn, one more turn, one more turn. I'm going to load up a game of Civ 4 Fall from Heaven at 5 p.m. on a Friday, and I'm going to come back to awareness Saturday morning at dawn. Right? That's what technology does. We lose that insular cortex stuff. Then what happens is we blame ourselves because now it's like, oh my God, I've stayed up all night. I'm so undisciplined. And then what happens is we start to hate ourselves. Okay? Like, look at this language. Incapable of everything. I want to be perfect. I've tried to be productive. And so all of that negative emotion comes roaring back. And when all that negative emotion comes roaring back, that in turn leads to things like procrastination. Because it's hard to focus on homework when internally you're filled with self-loathing, right? Like that kind of makes sense, right? The more self-loathing I feel, the harder it is to do homework. And then we call this thing procrastination. But what we know is that a lot of procrastination has to do with incorrect emotional processing and incorrect emotional awareness. We just call it procrastination because we're not even aware of what we feel on the inside. And at the end of the cycle, we feel so bad about ourselves that we're teeing ourselves up for failure next time around. So once I feel really terrible about myself, do I sit there and process up my emotions, talk to my friends, go see a therapist, work with a coach? Do I like, like actually like take this kind of situation and, and like really work through it and undo all the emotional damage? Of course not. I make a post on the internet. People give me like solutions. They're like, hey, use this task management system which can be useful, don't get me wrong, but none of that emotional stuff gets addressed. And if none of that emotional stuff gets addressed, you can use whatever task management systems you want to. If you wake up in the morning and you feel like you're a waste of a human being, it's going to get really hard to be motivated. Right? Because what kind of stuff motivates people? Inspiration motivates people. Excitement motivates people. Confidence motivates people. But at the end of this whole cycle, we're beating ourselves up. We have a bunch of negative emotion and the whole cycle repeats. So what do you do in this kind of situation? So a couple of simple things. The first is recognize your black and white thinking. So if you're thinking in all or nothing statements, if you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm a complete waste of space. Other people are perfect. I can't succeed in anything I do. Black and white thinking is a sign of emotional activity in the amygdala and the hippocampus. It means that you're emotionally charged and you're not thinking logically. It means you're thinking emotionally, right? So if you think about people who use a lot of black and white language, they're very emotional thinkers. They think they're logical, but they're really not logical, right? Because like the truth of the matter is the world is a nuanced place and very few things are black and white. Like it's just not how reality is. There isn't a religion that is better than all the other religions or a religion that is worse than all the other religions. Maybe that's a charged statement that's going to get in, invoke a lot of black and white thinking and engage emotions. If you responded to that and now you feel emotions, you kind of see what I'm saying. 
right? But people who talk that way tend to be very black and white thinkers. And if you challenge them on that, they will get very emotional. They'll use logic, sure, but like behind the logic is a bunch of emotion. And so you've got to decompress that emotion. So notice the black and white thinking and then start to ask yourself, okay, how did I start to feel so bad about myself? Start to notice a little bit about when I'm sitting down to do homework, how do I feel about that? And this is the key thing. If you're, if you're one of these people, I can guarantee you what you're going to say in that moment is who cares how I feel? I need to do it. Who cares what I feel? And it's by making that statement, you lose emotional awareness because now you're not exploring it. You're actively devaluing it. And when you actively devalue it and when you actively suppress it and ignore it, then it starts to manifest in other ways like procrastination, lack of motivation, spending five hours watching YouTube. Because negative emotions have to be dealt with. They will deal with you and keep dealing with you until you deal with them. So you've got to become more emotionally aware. Become aware of your black and white thinking. Start to ask yourself questions like, how do I feel about doing homework today? Do I want to do it? Do I not want to do it? Why don't I want to do it? Well, I need to do it. Who cares what I want? Well, like, I care what you want, right? What you want should be important to you. And oddly enough, by acknowledging what you want or what you care about and giving that value you actually make it easier to do the task. I'll give you all a simple example. So let's say that I'll just give you all kind of an example. So I, I was out a couple weekends ago with my kids and one of them wanted to eat something that wasn't available. Okay, so they're like, Dad, I want this food. And then I've got two options. I can say, I don't care what you want. You're going to eat what we give you. Right? You, you have to eat what, we have, what we've got. Like, we've only got one thing. We can't get it. So, like, I don't really, it doesn't matter what you want. You've got to eat what we give you. Or I can say, hey, I understand what you want. I'm sorry I can't give it to you. I'll do my best to get it for you next time. But I didn't know that you wanted that earlier. And I'd really appreciate it if you ate this anyway. And I'm going to do my level best to get it for you next time. How does that sound? Which one do you think leads to like better success? In both cases, the kid may end up eating it. But in one case, they're going to eat way better than the other. Right? Does that kind of make sense? So we have to acknowledge like, and this is where like sometimes... You know, we make sacrifices because we have to make sacrifices, but it's really nice to acknowledge the sacrifice and be honest about it, right? It's really nice to say, hey, like, I'm sorry that you have to do this. It really sucks. I really appreciate that you're doing it. I'm grateful. Like, that's going to lead to better stuff down the road, but that's not how we talk to ourselves. Need to do it. When you need to do something over the weekend, you're going to end up procrastinating until the last minute. That's how it works. So unfortunately, it's really common to like get ourselves distracted with technology usage. It turns out there's a lot going on in the brain. It starts with why we start to use a technology, which tends to be um, the most common reason is like emotional suppression and not having to face our emotions. Then we get sucked into it and we blame ourselves for watching it for five hours when we don't even acknowledge that there's a whole ton of like people who are doing consumer neuroscience to keep you there for five hours. And there are people with PhDs and MDs and economists and all kinds of stuff working to keep you on that website for five hours because there's an attention marketplace. And what is bo being bought or sold in the attention marketplace? You are. And then we blame ourselves. And with a complete lack of compassion and a lot of black and white thinking and self-blame, we set ourselves up for failure tomorrow. Because then tomorrow, if I'm a POS who wastes all my time watching YouTube and I'm filled with self-loathing, how am I ever going to be inspired to actually like do my homework? Never going to happen. It's going to be a, a slog 
every single time. Every single time you bring yourself to do your homework, it's like you're dragging cattle. It's so hard. And then since it takes so much effort for you to even do homework for a little while, you're mentally fatigued, mentally exhausted. And then what do you think you reach for? Technology. Because now you're fatigued. And so it's super, super challenging. Unfortunately, increasingly common. And why is it increasingly common? Is it because people are becoming lazier and more disciplined on the whole? No. It is because there is an attention marketplace, which people are getting very savvy to in learning how to manipulate. And they realize that if you spend six hours on YouTube instead of Twitch, or Twitch instead of TikTok, one of those platforms gets money and the other two don't. And all the platforms want money. And they're happy to give you the content that you want to. I don't think necessarily the platforms are nefarious, by the way. I think a lot of times the platforms are out there trying to, like, do good. They're like, hey, we're just entertainers, right? We're not worried about that kind of stuff. But as this stuff is evolving, it's starting to get out of control. And sometimes we end up being the victims. And that's where you can rage at the platforms all you want to. I don't know how effective that's going to be. This is where ultimately I think you've got to understand what's going on in my mind and what can I do about it. So hopefully that helps if you're struggling with productivity and end up, you know, using a technology platform for like six hours and procrastinating. Questions? Okay. So let's go ahead and meditate. So um, we're going to teach you all an interesting meditation today. It's going to be a little bit different. So this is going to be a two or three part meditation that we're going to do today. Um, and what we're going to do is do the, a preparatory meditation for emotional digestion and emotional awareness. Okay. So right now we've got an event going on that's about understanding your emotions. So if you want to understand your emotions and digest your emotions, process your emotions, there are some meditative techniques that according to the theory of meditation is useful at emotional processing, let's say. So a lot of what we're going to be sharing with y'all has not been studied in clinical trials, but this is sort of what the theory is uh, suggests, okay? So we're going to teach y'all uh, a cleansing practice that will be kind of a preparation for another meditative practice. So this is a kind of pranayam that is geared towards the Manipura Chakra. For those of y'all that are familiar with that stuff, we'll kind of just explain very briefly. So pranayam is a breathing practice, and this specifically is a shuddhi or cleansing practice. So this is kind of like, you know, cleaning your instruments before you kind of get down to business. The other thing, the Manipura Chakra is our navel chakra, and governs emotions, and more specifically, digestion. So the Manipura Chakra is all of the things that are not us, that it then turns into us. So if we think about, uh, let me explain that again. So the process of digestion is something that takes something that is not you and turns it into you. So for example, when I eat a sandwich, the sandwich is not me. It's an external thing. It goes into my stomach. My stomach breaks apart the sandwich, and then those get absorbed, and it gets turned into muscles and nail, nails and blood and, you know, hair and all this kind of stuff. So digestion and metabolism is the process of taking something that is not you and turning it into you. Now, in the case, sometimes what we want to be careful about is maldigestion. So when we don't digest things properly, we run into problems. And good examples of not digesting things properly in the yogic idea is something like trauma where we have some amount of emotions that are stored up and they're sitting in our stomach and they don't like get processed. So they weigh us down and they create all kinds of negative impacts on our mind. So we know scientifically that processing trauma is healthy. So the yogis thought that certain meditative practices will help in emotional processing. So we're going to teach you all a preparatory practice that will sort of set us up for the meditation that we'll do maybe on Wednesday. Okay. So what we're going to do is sit up straight. This is really important. We're going to sit up straight, back straight, neck straight, 
head straight. You can lay down, actually, if you want to. The most important thing is that your spine is straight. And in this practice, what we're going to do is we're going to slowly breathe in, and then we're going to roll our stomach around, our abdomen, with a full breath of air, and then we're going to slowly exhale. Okay? I know it sounds kind of weird, but I'll demonstrate. You guys may not be able to see the belly, but... So here's what we're going to do. So I'm going to close my eyes and take a deep breath in. So actually, we're going to purse our lips and breathe in through our mouth. So we're going to kind of go like this. And then now my abdomen feels full. As I breathe in, I'm going to push my abdomen out. Okay, I'm going to expand the abdomen. We're going to do belly breathing. So I'll do it again. And now what I'm going to do is roll my stomach around. And then when you're done, you can slowly exhale. Now you all kind of do it with me. Deep breath in through pursed lips. Push the belly out and then roll your stomach. I'm kind of doing a counterclockwise motion. If y'all are sort of having trouble with it, let's finish that round. Go ahead and exhale. Inhale again. If you're having trouble with it, what you can do is twist your stomach to the left. Almost like you're pulling away from a blow on the right. If someone's trying to tickle you on your right side, like imagine how you'd pull away. So pull to the left and then pull back towards your spine, and then pull to the right, and then push out away from your spine, and then repeat the process. It's almost like four cardinal directions. And then slowly exhale. Now we're going to do five breaths. Second breath. Roll that belly. And slowly exhale. Next breath. Roll the belly. And two more. And last breath. And out. How do y'all feel? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I 
All right, so, <laughs> so many things to talk about. So I ask people how they feel. What I get back is that was super weird. I'm not sure if I did the belly rolling correctly. My belly is sore. I don't know, man. I'm high right now. I feel sick. I hated breathing through the mouth. Someone feels pregnant. Aware, good, nice, exhausted, interesting. Um, tech teller, great question. Should this be done on an empty stomach? Yeah. So this should be done on an empty stomach, ideally. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, JK Ray is sweating. I'm sweating too. So a couple things about this practice. So as we get more advanced around here, chat, we're going to teach you all more advanced practices. More advanced practices can be more powerful, but can also be more uncomfortable. So a couple of safety things. One is that if you feel uncomfortable, don't force yourself to do it. If you feel lightheaded, you can stop, you know, make sure you're okay with it. Don't force it. Second thing is that <clears throat> it's okay for the practice to be a little bit challenging and you're not supposed to feel blissed out. Remember, this is not a meditation to calm you. This is not a meditation to increase, increase clarity or focus. This is a meditation to activate the whatever weird pseudoscientific psycho-spiritual parts of your being that will help you with metabolism and emotional digestion. So when we feel like kind of exhausted afterward, I think that that's sort of normal. So like when we think about, you know, meditation apps, like I don't think they advertise meditate with us and you're going to feel exhausted at the end of it. This meditation feels like work because it is. And so as we do this track of meditations, it can feel kind of intense and exhausting and that's okay. I would do this practice. Remember, we just did five breaths, right? So even that can be too much. I was feeling like the fifth was really a lot for me. So you can start with three. You can do it for less than five minutes or do it for five minutes at a time. And we'll teach all the other parts. I'd say do it three times a week. If it starts to feel uncomfortable, by all means, stop. Okay. But, you know, some of these techniques are a little bit more intense. Okay. Um... Who are we raiding today, chat? What do y'all think? S Fand? Okay, we can we can raid S Fand. What's S fan up to nowadays? Hmm? What is S fan PogChamp doing? OTK shenanigans? Perfect. Exactly what we're looking for. Okay, let's raid S-Fand. Um, we'll see y'all on Wednesday. I'm not entirely sure exactly what we're going to be doing on Wednesday, but um, have there been any studies on self-sabotage at all? What a great question. Pew, pew, LB. I, I think, I don't know if they study it that way because self-sabotage is an imp a scientifically imprecise term. But we talk a lot about self-sabotage. Maybe we can do a whole lecture on it at some point. But I think there are a lot of reasons why we self-sabotage. It's kind of like an umbrella term. But send S fans some love. We'll see y'all uh, on Wednesday, hopefully. Take care. Adios, everybody. Bye-bye.